I thought that probably it will be nice for me to speak on prevention as well as the management of zone-specific flexor tendon rehabilitation besides pitfalls. So my format of presentation this afternoon will include understanding mechanism of finger flexion. We'll look at the classification of tendon injuries, which we have known for years. However, my major focus will be on factors that leads to pitfalls. We'll look at various protocols that, have, that are being used even today. And there are some new ones which will be coming up soon. So the focus will be on zone-specific pitfalls and what are the associated complications with this. And I'll go a bit deeper into pattern mechanics of some of these complications. And then I'll present my clinical reasoning for the management of these complications as well as how do we prevent that right from the beginning. So if we look at the mechanism of finger flexion, we know when the finger or hand is fully extended, we move the fingers right down to the palm. So there are various changes occur sequentially as we move our fingers from fully extended position to fully flexed position. The purple structure that you see is a spiral oblique retinacular ligament. So when we initiate flexion of our fingers, we know that both these tendons simultaneously contract. However, it initiates PIP joint flexion first. And subsequently, your spiral oblique retinacular ligament becomes slack, allowing profundus to produce flexion of the distal phalangeal joint. With increased flexion of the PIP and DIP joint, the lateral bands start to migrate distally and volarly at the anatomical axis of rotation at PIP joint. And as the PIP and DIP joint flexion increases, your extensor digitorum communis moves distally, moving the sagittal band distally as well at the metacarpophalangeal joint. And therefore, that allows the intrinsics to produce an excursion, causing flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint. And this is how we complete our finger flexion from a fully extended position. So therefore, what we saw is translation of lateral bands which was initially at the above, uh, above the joint axis at PIP, now becoming volar to the joint axis at PIP. And secondarily, we see that there is a differential tendon gliding between FDS and FDP, giving us complete flexion of the PIP to start off with, then DIP, and finally the metacarpophalangeal joint with the help of intrinsics. We have known about the zones of these injuries, and these zones have been divided in accordance with anatomical insertions or locations of certain uh, structures. Other classification that was introduced uh, for finger rupture or, or profundus rupture is by, is by Leddy and Packer and is classically known as Jersey finger classification. Grade one has a more serious complication because of massive tendon retraction proximally. And the patients often end up having serious PIP and DIP joint flexion contracture. Grade two has a less serious complication. However, they are still susceptible for producing PIP and DIP joint flexion contracture, but not as severe as we see in grade one. Whereas grade three still has a tendency to produce DIP joint flexion contracture. However, the Contracture formation distally is not as severe as you would see in grade one and two. And then there are two other classifications which are introduced with bony avulsion, tendon rupture, and so on. So now, how or why there is a failure? The factors that lead to failure is the injury and the wound. Not every injury is the same. Some of them may be a crush type of an injury, some may be transection caused by a knife. And here you see on the left-hand side, you see two different pictures, an individual cutting and uh, avocado 
and the tendons are stationary where the hand is holding the avocado, whereas the bottom picture, you see that the person is trying to pry, cut uh, avocado, and if the hand slides on the blade, then the tendons, of course, are transected. So therefore, no injuries are the same. And especially there is some amount of tendon retraction where there's an active tendon load as compared to if there is a stationary cut. We treat different types of patients having different ethnic background. They're diff they're, they have a different age group. And they're likely to not heal exactly in a copybook style. The other factor that may lead to pitfall is anatomical variation. And these anatomical variations such as deficient superficialis in strong, small finger or patient having Comstock Lindbergh sign. And unfortunately, not every patient is repaired on the same very day when they transect the tendons. So the timing may vary. Some patients will have primary repair, some patients are delayed, or delayed primary repair and so on. And then depending on how the surgeons are trained in terms of handling the tendon, the greater amount of periosteal, or sorry, um, uh, uh, sort of disruption or rough handling of the tendon may cause adhesion formation. And we know that not every one of us heal exactly in a copybook style. I've seen that patients who are from African background tend to produce massive scars as compared to some Caucasians, even though they technically should not produce as heavy a scar as the, as the Africans do, but they some of them still have a tendency to produce greater scars. And then patient's compliance. Patient's compliance is such that some patients who follow the, uh, follow the rules by rules, they may still have some complications, whereas some patients who have cheated on us and not followed the instructions have done remarkably well. So that's inexplainable. And then therapy, definitely, because not every one of us uses the same protocol. They may be uh, familiar with one protocol versus the others. However, despite of our understanding of contracture formation, I still get patients like this who are placed in a bulky dressing, wrist is flexed, MCP and PIP joints are flexed after surgery. And patients may be sent to hand therapy on the same very day or maybe after about a week. And in, in a situation where the patient is referred to us, a week later, they already have a pre-established flexion contractures of some, uh, some kind. And then we are treating or dealing with these pre-established flexion contractures trying to gain flex, sorry, extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint as well as interphalangeal joint. So most important take home message here is post-operative positioning following tendon repairs. So many a times we don't receive uh, detailed information about the tendon injury or tendon repair. And this is absolutely must for the therapist to have so that they can custom tailor the treatment for patients who have had uh, repairs of the tendon. So looking at flexor tendon protocols, these are the protocols uh, which are still most commonly used. For example, Kleinard protocol, which functions on active extension passive flexion and Washington regime who uses combination of Kleinard and Dura. But if we dive deep into these protocols, we'll see that these patients perform passive flexion. Passive flexion is performed by the rubber band that we attach to the fingertip. However, the patients are encouraged to perform active extension against rubber band traction. So you can very well see that patients have passive flexion and active extension only. Whereas Duran talks about passive motion of the PIP and DIP joint. So here, of course, you have passive flexion, passive extension. So these protocols raise several questions. For example, when a person is performing passive flexion, passive extension, and if you pay closer attention to Duran's article, it's stated that three to five millimeters of tendon motion is enough to prevent firm adhesion formation between the tendons in a fibrosis sheet. And the question arises, 
Is it really three to five millimeters of tendon motion? Is it enough when you have somewhere between 20 to 30 millimeters of tendon excursion, and especially in zone two? Now, looking at both these protocols, we know that both these or all the three protocols have no active flexion. And because you do not have, you do not allow these patients to perform active flexion, we know that the consequences of not performing active flexion may lead to uh, the tendon buckling because major focus here is passive flexion. And Don Lalonde has brought to our attention that when you perform passive flexion, the tendons buckle. And because these patients are not performing active flexion of the fingers, there is no proximal tendon excursion. And therefore, by doing active extension against rubber band traction or performing passive extension, we know that these tendons only glide distally during ex extension. So the question then arises, are these the reasons for pitfalls? And maybe so. Uh, and then we'll look into some of the other protocols which have a different focus in terms of management. So there are various active motion protocols which you will see in the literature. Strickland and Cannon introduced wrist tenodesis. Belfast regime was truly the first advocate of controlled active motion program. However, this Belfast regime did not gain much of popularity in North America because of somewhere between 10 to 12% failure rate or rupture rate. Tang regime is again somewhat similar, which allows patients to uh, perform controlled active motion. And of course, Lalonde and Higgins, they, they use wide awake procedure, looking at intraoperative motion. And then of course, the Manchester protocol, which is somewhat popular in various regions of the world. And health protocol, I'm going to elaborate at a later stage uh, when we discuss uh, the management from our point of view. So if we, pay, if we pay closer attention to this active motion protocol, all these authors have started with passive flexion as the warm-up exercise. And then they have encouraged patients to perform active tendon motion in both the directions. That means going into extension and then performing a control flexion of the PIP as well as DIP joint. So now, of course, we can very well say that based on some of these protocols, then we should be able to improve our results and have a better outcome following tendon repairs. Now my main focus will be on zone specific pitfall. Zone one, we know that FDP has somewhere between five to seven millimeters of tendon excursion. So if we say that profundus has five millimeters of tendon excursion in the distal phalanx, and if the DIP joint happens to have 60 degrees or 75 degrees of flexion, then one millimeter of tendon excursion is producing somewhere between 12 to 15 degrees arc of motion. And you can very well see that if you lose one millimeter of tendon excursion of profundus, then you have lost somewhere between 12 to 15 degrees arc of motion at the dis distal pharynx. So in such situations, your likelihood of having poorer grip strength in comparison with the contralateral side. PIP and DIP joint flexion contractures, especially of the small finger is more very common. The reason being that every structure is smaller in nature. And we see that when you have an established PIP and DIP joint flexion contractures jointly together, they produce secondary metacarpophalangeal joint hyperextension tendency. So mechanically or architecturally, if you look at the construct of the small finger metacarpal head, it has a greater volar as well as greater dorsal curvature. So therefore, the finger especially has a strong tendency to hyperflex at the metacarpophalangeal joint, but at the same time, the PIP and DIP joint flexion contracture produces hyperextension tendency at the metacarpophalangeal joint, especially in the small finger. And there are some secondary mechanical changes that are associated with 
uh, proximal phalanx going into significant amount of hyperextension in relation to the metacarp. So this is classical, you see that hyperextension will produce certain change. So if you do a literature search, you'll come across a paper written by one author who was an advocate or maybe still is uh, an advocate of for allowing patients to have active tension in zone one and two injuries. The author recommended that DIP joint should be positioned somewhere between 40 to 5, 45 degrees of flexion for a period of three weeks. And then her, uh, her conclusion was that this technique of early control motion of the PIP and DIP joint while DIP joint is held in 40 to 45 degrees of flexion produces approximately three millimeters of excursion of the profundus in zone one when these patients perform somewhere between 45 and 75 degrees arc of motion. However, sustained position or posture of the distal phalanx in flexion will definitely produce DIP joint flexion contraction, which ultimately will result into a secondary swan neck deformity, as you see in this individual. This patient was offered a corrective surgery. However, he declined at that stage because of his new employment in, uh, 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 in a company. But one, one month later, he came back with a snapping swan neck, as you see right here. So now the tendons, the lateral bands have translated dorsal to the anatomical axis of rotation because the DIP joint is flexed. And the lateral bands, since they translated dorsal to the anatomical axis of rotation at the PIP joint, they became a tension band. And this tension band effect is causing secondary swan neck associated with snapping, causing uh, articular degeneration uh, uh, of some kind, giving him quite a bit of pain and discomfort. So mechanically, we looked at, per, by performing cadaver dissection, we looked at what will happen if we flex the DIP joint. We identified that DIP joint flexion causes dorsal translation of lateral band, as you see in cadaver dissection. And that increases tension at the PIP joint. So DIP joint flexion contractures, once established, are difficult to correct or manage because of the poor leverage system. So prevention, therefore, is a key. It is a, uh, it is a critical factor that we prevent right from the beginning so that there is no DIP joint flexion contraction. Now, there are many uh, papers that talk about providing patients with the ring splint if there is a swan neck deformity, but every swan neck deformity is different. Swan neck deformity truly is, is not a diagnosis. It is a swan, it is a, um, a pathological situation. It's, it's a condition which happens as a result of primary pathology. So whenever you are describing a swan neck deformity, it is essential for you to write the cause of swan neck whether it is caused by DIP joint flexion contracture uh, or the volar plate tear. So you'll see that when you have a reduced gliding amplitude of the flexor tendons, you tend to hyperflex the metacarpophalangeal joint. The hyperflexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint will make flexor tendons slack. And as a result, DIP joint will not have enough of excursion of these tendons. And therefore the DIP joint will not have flexion and dorsal joint capsule eventually will become tight, limiting DIP joint passive motion and subsequently active motion. So the other factor is if the profundus has lost gliding amplitude, we can still uh, uh, gain some amount of excursion of the tendon. So we provide patients with the PIP joint blocking splint and facilitate FDP excursion. And uh, as the patients gain motion, uh, then you can, you can use electrical stimulation and then encourage patients to perform control resisted motion when the PIP joint is held in neutral. Now let's focus on zone two uh, complication. Tendon ruptures are relatively less common nowadays because of our understanding of tendon biomechanics. 
However, if the patients are not following instructions specifically and not wearing a splint, then they're likely to rupture their tendon. However, the most common complication is reduced excursion of FDS and FDP in a fibrosia sheet. And it's quite likely that the patients may have uh, associated flexion contractures as well. You'll see patients having lumbrical plus, especially when both these tendons have scarred down to the fibrosia sheath, distal to the metacarpophalangeal joint. And we'll look at the uh, management of these. So looking at the complications in zone two, as we know that there are many, the tendon adhesion is most common and not having differential tendon motion between flexor deterrent profundus and flexor deterrent superficially. PIP joint flexion contractures is very common. And as a result of PIP joint flexion contracture, your metacarpophalangeal joint will definitely show a tendency to hyperextend at the metacarpophalangeal joint. MCP joint hyperextension, I mentioned already, but when you have a reduced gliding amplitude, your uh, MCP joint hyperflexes and quadriga effect definitely is one of the primary cause of not having complete flexion of the edges and fingers if one is stable. So here, of course, the video that you see has uh, limited differential tendon motion between FDS and MDP. So therefore, there's an incomplete flexion of the ring and small finger at PIP as well as DIP joint. Here, this is the lumbrical plus. As you see that when you flex the finger passively and ask the person to hold, the finger abruptly extends when you let go the load and as the patient is attempting to hold that position. And lumbrical pluses are always seen in situation where you have a deficient superficial. That means that the small finger is dependent on FDP excursion to flex the PIP and DIP joint completely. And if the tendon is cut down in zone two, it will definitely cause or produce lumbrical plus sign, as you see in this situation. So PIP joint flexion contracture, how, we, how do we manage those? So technically, we should be keeping an eye that patients don't develop PIP joint flexion contractures, but you can see that this particular individual is a heavy scar former. So therefore, upon identifying his finger's tendency to go in flexion, we had to change the dorsal blocking splint into a serial extension splinting. And then using ultrasound, electrical stimulation and CPM, and then using elastomer insults for scar management, we could regain finger extension as well as finger flexion as you see in this particular case. And we have many of these types. So the results are fascinating with early detection and early management. It's important for us to understand the biomechanics of MCP joint hyperextension, especially when we have a PIP joint flexion contraction. So when we attempt extension, there is a combined vectors of central slip of extensor deterrent commonis and flexor deterrent superficialis jointly together will produce hyperextension tendency at the metacarpophalangeal joint. And as the metacarpophalangeal joint rides in hyperextension, there is an increased pull caused by the, the superficialis and PIP joint will flex. So in order for us to correct that, then we had to block the metacarpophalangeal joint in neutral or in flexion in order to facilitate the excursion of the central slip so that it causes a dynamic effect, bringing the PIP joint in greater and greater extension over time. So here, of course, the patient has a formation of PIP joint flexion contracture. Uh, so we, uh, we use a MP block uh, on the posterior side to increase PIP joint extension. And if, it is resolving, then well and good. If not, then we must consider a serial PIP joint extension splinting within a dorsal blocking splint in order to prevent contracture formation. But what if it has already established? As you see that this person's metacarpophalangeal joint hyperextends. So we provided this patient with an MP block splint and we allowed this patient to perform tendon acceleration exercises. 
So it's important for us to understand the strength difference between flexors and extensors. Your flexors are four to six times stronger as compared to the extensors. And therefore, upon having flexion contracture, your extensors are incapable of generating the same amount of tension as it did before, and therefore flexors will always take over. So therefore, it is essential for us to strengthen the extensors by using or by, by performing resisted extension uh, exercises twice as much as you're performing active flexion exercises. And then here, of course, it's important for us to understand the mechanism of finger extension. The mechanism of finger extension uh, is uh, the excursion of the central tendon to begin with the, when the fingers are fully flexed. So when we initiate finger extension, when, when the fingers are fully flexed, your central slip initiates PIP joint motion first. And then as the PIP joint extension improves, the lateral bands then are translating dorsal to the anatomical axis of rotation at the PIP joint. And subsequently, it is producing extension at the distal side. So it's very essential for us to really understand the mechanism of extension and incorporate the translation of lateral bands uh, about the joint axis by using various methods to regain finger extension. For the longest time, we were we were led to believe that place and hold increases excursion of the flexor tendon. However, Don Lalonde showed us that by placing the finger in flex position and asking a person to hold that position in flexion, the tendon undergoes some jerky action. So he recommended that the, this particular method of management for flexor tendon is inefficient because when you flex the finger passively, the tendon buckles and the trend tendon has very minimal excursion proximally. Quadriga effect, the term quadriga was coined by Verdan back in 1960. He identified that reduced excursion of profundus in one finger will have an effect on excursion of uh, flexor deuterium profundus on edges and digits. So this should be, it reads FDS, but however, it should be FDP. So reduced F FDP gliding will definitely have an effect on uh, motion of the adjacent digit. So we were curious to see which finger is the most notorious one to produce strong quadriga effect. We identified with a, uh, from our study that ring finger produced the greatest detriment to the remaining fingers and it had an effect of about 70, sorry, 47% reduction in total active motion. And then 35 and 26% uh, decrease in total active motion of small and long fingers. So it suggests us that if a person has a quadriga effect, depending on which finger is involved, you have an inability to flex the adjacent digit at the PIP as well as DIP joint. And subsequently, because of reduced motion at the PIP and DIP joint, the joints will undergo stiffness as you see in this particular individual at the bottom slide. So hyperflexion we already talked about and we must provide these patients with an MP block splint to increase the excursion of flexor deuterium profundus and superficial. So this patient is uh, showing us uh, as to how much uh, gains he made with an MP block splint and he has good flexion of the PIP and DIP joint. How do we manage lumbrical plus? We manage this by triple body taping. My preference is to ta tape distal phalanges, the middle phalanx as well as proximal phalanx, so you are minimizing hyperactivity of the, of the lumbrical muscle. And then we use electrical stimulation to maximize excursion of flexor deuterium profundus and superficialis. And if the patients are not responding to therapy due to dense adhesion contracture or adhesion formation, then we must prepare that digit for uh, future tenolysis procedure. Tendon ruptures are, uh, if it has happened, then the goal of therapy is to maximize passive digital motion. And we use triple body taping, as I mentioned earlier, so that we prevent the finger going into lumbrical plus 
and then we prepare the digit for stage flexor tendon reconstruction. So we see that there are a number of situations that are likely to arise as a result of a particular protocol or management that is being used. So therefore, we have to be cognizant enough in understanding the pathology and pathomechanics and how we custom tailor the treatment program to maximize our results. So we did some cadaveric dissection to identify the relationship between flexor deuterium profundus and flexor deuterium superficial. So if you look at the anatomical orientation of superficialis in relation to profundus, proximally, the superficial is superior to profundus. Centrally, your profundus is, sorry, your, your superficialis is lateral to profundus, and distally, your flexor deuterium superficialis is posterior to profundus. So in other words, the orientation of superficialis changes in relation to profundus as we go from proximal region to distal region. So in order for us to understand the pathological situations, we uh, divided these three sections into three different subzones. So we divided uh, them into zone 2A, where the superficialis is posterior to profundus, zone 2B, where, where superficialis is lateral to profundus, and zone 2C is superficialis, is superficial to profundus. So that we could create uh, adhesion or simulate adhesion formation in these regions and see as to how the tendon excursion produces how many degrees of flexion at the PIP as well as DIP joint. So here, when the tendons have full excursion, you can see that the finger is flexing beautifully right down to the palm. But when we simulated tendon adhesion, as you see in the specimen, we identified that location of adhesion is limiting motion of the PIP as well as DIP. And this was kind of interesting. So here, zone 2C, when we pulled on the tendon, the flexor datum superficial is being superficial to profundus. There's a reduced amount of gliding of both these tendons in a fibro ratio sheet. So we had limited or reduced PIP and DIP joint flexion. When we simulated tendon adhesions distally, when the uh, superficialis is lateral to profundus, we identified that we had a greater PIP joint flexion than DIP joint. And then when we simulated tendon adhesion distally, we identified that we had much greater PIP and DIP joint flexion. However, this is something which we don't know exactly where the adhesions will form. However, we know that if there is not adequate differential tendon motion during the healing phases of the tendon, the adhesions are likely to form where there is the least amount of motion between these two tendons and in a fibrosis sheet. So this was our focus mainly to revamp or re-modify the program that we were using. We we're using early active motion programs, so, but we now had to add something to maximize uh, excursion of flexor deuterium profundus as well as superficialis so that we gain greater and greater motion of the PIP and DIP joint. So the modification of our therapy is based on number of articles that we refer to. We refer to Amadeus article, uh, Zao, Savage, and then of course the other articles led us to believe that we must change our method of management. So looking at Wu and Tang's paper that was published in hand clinics back in 2013, it showed us that when we allow these patients to move their fingers actively, we have an increased vascular supply with mobilization. It helps in stimulating tenocytes and maturation process and helps in remodeling of the tendons. We have a greater increased tensile strength because of the motion we know that the motion stimulates arterial flow, venous and lymphatic return, and the tendons, because they are moved earlier, then we have a better excursion uh, property. So Wu and Tang suggested that we allow patients to perform slight flexion. 
However, patients are not that smart enough in knowing what exactly is slight flexion. So we had to sort of redesign our concept in their mind as to what slight flexion could be. And then as these patients progress in their post-operative periods, then go on to allowing these patients to perform moderate flexion. That means that we are allowing these patients to perform mid-range, low resistance flexion, um, and then later on extreme flexion as they go further, going from the inflammatory phase to fibroplastia to the remodeling phase. However, we wanted these patients to consistently perform consistent motion when they were performing active motion. So we talked about the small finger being the most notorious one and excursion of the tendon is somewhat limited. So we always began with passive finger range of motion as the warm up exercise. And then for small finger, we allowed these patients to perform flexion to two finger distance. So consistently, I mean, they're holding these two fingers at the distal palmar crease and the patient is asked to perform active flexion of the PIP and DIP joint. An emphasis is placed that they ensure that the DIP joint is flexing to this two finger limit. And if it happens to be index long or ring, we encourage these patients to perform active flexion to three finger distance in a linear manner. And then uh, the following week, two finger distance in the second week, one finger distance in the third week, and to distal palmar crease in the fourth week post-operatively. We maintained the, this active motion to the distal palmar crease for additional two weeks and then went on to uh, then allowing them to perform wrist flexion, uh, finger extension, wrist extension, finger extension. So on the same very day as we were encouraging these patients to perform active flexion of the fingers to the linear distance or specified linear distance, we encourage these patients to perform wrist tenodesis. So wrist tenodesis is wrist flexion, active finger extension at PIP and DIP joint, wrist extension and active assisted finger flexion. And then as the edema subsided and the finger motion improved, we encourage them to go even further into flexion. So the results are fascinating. The, the, the range of motion is superb, as you can see right here. We have treated quite a number of these patients. However, we don't have a large enough series yet to publish our paper for zone one injury. And this is zone two, as you can see, doing remarkably well. This is another case with multiple tendon repairs showing great flexion. And uh, of course, now we'll go on to zone three complications. So zone three is the largest area. It is a larger area uh, zone as, as compared to zone, to zone two. So therefore, based on the anatomical orientation of tendons and origin of lumbricals, and then the tendon emerging through or out of flexor retinaculum, we divided these zone three injuries into two subcategories. One proximal and then second one distal. So we have had few patients who had an injury or tendons were transected just proximal to A1 pulley and these patients' hands were immobilized in a dorsal blocking splint. We were doing Duran method of management and we identified that because of incomplete extension of the PIP and DIP joint, the adhesions had formed between FDS and FDP and the lumbrical. So as a result, these adhesions limited distal excursion uh, of uh, profundus and superficial. So what we saw clinically, we simulated that in our, in our biomechanics lab. We sutured the lumbrical to the tendons proximal to A1 pulley. And by attempting to perform passive extension, we identified that these adhesions limited excursion or distal excursion of the profundus and superficialis because of the adhesion formation. So we, we recommended that to prevent adhesion formation between tendons and lumbricals proximal to A1 pulley, we must adjust the position of the metacarpophalangeal joint by 10 degrees on a weekly basis so that even though these adhesions form at this region, 
they are the adhesions are uh, remodelable with the positioning of the metacarpophalanges one so this uh, two uh, cases uh, or two uh, case, uh, slides a uh, video show excellent results and we identified that uh, if the tendons are transected just distal to flexor retinaculum if the adhesion forms between these two tendons now the central two tendons have become one tendon so now when a person attempts flexion of the fingers, both these fingers will flex together. And of course, when we attempt extension, both these fingers will extend together. That means that patients will not have independent motion of one finger at a time. So as a result, patient will have difficulty using their hand for specific activities, such as using a keyboard or uh, using a piano or a violin if they happen to be a musician. So we learned from this particular individual. He's a nephrology re uh, resident. He cut his uh, ulnar tendons. However, after a surgery, we mobilized him in a controlled manner. When we attained good flexion and extension of his fingers, we discharged him. However, when he came back, he came back a, a month, sorry, a week later, setting that he is highly dissatisfied with his motion of his finger. Uh, so we have, when we asked him for the reason as to why he is dissatisfied, he mentioned to us that he could not perform rectal exam because to perform rectal exam, he had to flex ulnar two digits and extend radial two digits. And we identified based on this complication that we should have custom tailored the treatment for this individual so that this situation never arose. So looking at the complication in zone three and zone five, we had a limited composite wrist and digital flexion that a reduced flexor tendon excursion that reduced independent flexion and extension of the fingers. So having identified this as one of the complications uh, which we had to treat these patients with electrical stimulation, serial splinting and so on, uh, we thought that this is something that is preventable. So if the patients had long flexor tendon tightness, we used uh, dynamic or static progressive splints. However, we use electrical stimulation for extensors because we wanted to create a balancing act between extensors and flexors. So how do we prevent this from happening? So when you're, you have a multiple tendons cut uh, in zone five, or zone three, we want to encourage patients to perform one finger extension at a time and one finger flexion at a time. So we modified this treatment program, especially based on our observation of these individuals. And we, at a later stage, we allow these patients to perform FDS and FDP gliding separately. That is around six weeks mark. And then patients have independent motion. So the results are very encouraging with full house or spaghetti wrist. By using this or modification of the treatment program, patients have good extension and flexion of each and every finger independently. So I think my slides got stuck. So, okay. So here the person is performing one finger extension at a time. With, this is only possible through modification. So thumb complications are different. They're somewhat similar to what we already discussed, but one must keep in mind that zone one and zone two, uh, FPL repair may lead to IP joint flexion contracture that will, again, similar to the fingers, it will result into a secondary swan neck deformity. But here, of course, if a person has a secondary swan neck deformity as a result of IP joint flexion contracture, they are susceptible for having CMC joint arthrosis over time. So the prevention, therefore, is the key. So we know that flexor pollicis longus is passing through two uh, slips of flexor pollicis brevis. So uh, injury where the tendon is uh, repaired is quite likely that the tendon may get scarred down to flexor pollicis brevis and they'll have a reduced FPL excursion. So the patient's dexterity and coordination is lost. 
it's important that we identify the position of the CMC and MP joint so that you can facilitate excursion of flexor pollicis longus. So here you can see that by positioning the MP joint and CMC joint, we are increasing the excursion of flexor pollicis longus. We came across few cases where patients demonstrated that they had a presence of reverse Lindbergh. So this is a patient who had uh, multiple tendons transected uh, in zone five. Uh, and then because of this, uh, his hand was kind of limited in terms of function. We had, to, we had to position his CMC and MP and IP joint in complete extension when we performed finger flexion so that we, can, we could resolve the reverse uh, Lindbergh sign as you see in this case. So in conclusion, we know that the flexor tendon rehabilitation is now becoming less challenging because of uh, advances in surgical and therapeutic management. We have an understanding, better understanding of tendon biomechanics. Suturing techniques have definitely have been improvised. And then of course, we know that tendon, seal will, tendon healing will be uh, in accordance with how these tendons are managed and therefore with improvisation of therapy procedures uh, following tendon repair or reconstruction, we can definitely get, get great results. So it's important that we understand these complications which will assist us in producing better outcome of flexor tendon surgeries because right from the inception of these, these uh, pitfalls, we can be proactive in minimizing these pitfalls and maximize these results. Thank you. Uh, these, these are my email addresses. If anybody has any questions, they can forward those to me. Or if you are interested in receiving our management, the health, uh, Roth, McFarlane, Hannah Appleton Center's management, I would be delighted to share that information with you. Thank you very much.